Good afternoon and welcome to this week's President's Technical. My name is Brian Borgon, Director of Technical Communications and Training. As always, we have a lot of great information for you today, and we certainly hope that you will find it all very useful. If you have any questions for today's town hall, remember to use the Q&A module denoted by the question mark icon in your Teams toolbar to submit your questions, and we will begin taking your questions right before the Q&A portion of today's town hall. Due to the number of participants and questions that we receive, it may not be possible to answer all of them. The panelists do, however, receive a copy of all questions after the town hall, and they will address them as appropriate. Looking ahead to our next town hall for faculty and staff, that will be held on Tuesday, October 27th at 4 p.m. Please be sure to join us then for more updates. For the latest information surrounding coronavirus, please be sure to visit our coronavirus webpage. This is also one of the places that you can find a recording of today's session after it is completed, along with recordings of our past town hall messages. For closed captioning, you can select CC in your video controls at the bottom right corner of your team screen. Additionally, if you need to change the caption language, select the settings icon and then captions slash subtitles and finally choose the desired language for your captions. Along with Dr. Saragosa, today's panel consists of Dr. Margot Martin, Vice President for Academic Affairs. Mary Kay Bailey, Vice President for Finance. Magunt Vaithilingam, Chief Information Officer. Patty Charlton, Vice President and Campus Provost for the Henderson Campus. Clarissa Coda, Vice President and Campus Provost for the North Las Vegas Campus. Dr. Bill Dial, Chief Human Resources Officer. Dr. Felicia Thomas, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs. And Kamiko Walton, Interim Associate Vice President and Provost for the West Charleston Campus. So now I'd like to introduce our President, Dr. Federico Saragossa. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon and welcome CSN family to yet another one of our COVID town hall meetings. I hope that you and your loved ones continue to be in good health and in good spirits. I would like to remind you that these town hall meetings were designed to provide all of us with an opportunity for real time information on COVID-19 developments and for activities related to our on campus migration. Today, I'm pleased to report that we will be providing you with breaking news on our class of 2019 commencement ceremony. My friends, this week continues to see changes related to the COVID indicators. In this reporting cycle, we're seeing an increase in confirmed COVID cases for the state of Nevada and especially for Southern Nevada. As I mentioned before, we're constantly monitoring the data and the guidance provided by our best scientists. And as the data changes, so do our state directives and so do our CSN and ANCHI COVID protocols. As a result, Patty is here to give us the most current information on CDC and state directives. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to Patty and the CSN panel. Patty, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Zaragoza, and it's a, a it's a pleasure to be with you here today. And so, um, Eric, if you could please advance the slide, I'd really appreciate that, or whoever, <laughs> Brian. So I wanted to start today with just giving some, some updates on what we have from our guidance. As Dr. Zaragoza said, that the environment is uh, continually changing and we stay very abreast of the the new information as we receive that both from the governor 
as well as from the CDC and other entities. And so first, uh, I wanted to share with you that we do have some increase, um, some changes in our entry uh, processes as far as how we report our cases. And so um, we've had a great opportunity and I really wanted to thank our chair of chairs, Dr. Davis, as well as the lead of our um, our academic deans, Dr. Spangler and Marco Martin and others for providing an opportunity for, for Carrie Sedlicek, myself and Bill Dial to share some of that, that new information. So in the past, we've been pro providing reports on positive cases that may have occurred or had a, a, um, a presence on campus, but now we need to ensure that we are tracking all students because we have opened different areas of the campus as well. So for example, students can go into our libraries, they can also go to our computer labs, and some of our students are also visiting our student union as well. And so what we want to ensure is that we are getting the best information, not just about students, but also with our faculty and staff. So any positive case, please, please ensure that you are reporting that through wellness at CSN. And it's not just from a reporting protocol process, but it's also so that we can connect our students our faculty and staff with resources. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that from Bill Dial shortly. I've received a lot of questions as well regarding some of the new directives that were issued in the last um, couple of weeks. So on September 29th, the governor issued what's called Directive 33, and that was um, the guidance for safe gatherings. And then also the next day or the following days on youth and adult sports. So I provided a reference link so that should you have any questions on where to find the latest information on those governor's directives, you can find that. Um, in, in just a nutshell, so what does that mean for CSN? So first, the, the capacity gathering did increase slightly. Uh, but we are also still required because of the size of our gathering space to still 50% of the fire code. So that really hasn't changed a significant amount for CSN, um, but we do continue to monitor all of our spaces and all of our activities accordingly. It does also increase some of our um, administrative uh, requirements, and so we're tracking that as well. We worked last week and over the last couple of weeks with all of our stakeholder and constituent groups from Faculty Senate, from NFA, AFA, Classified, and our student government regarding an activity and events procedure just for this COVID environment. And this is just a temporary policy, not a policy, but a procedure so that we can make sure that we are administrating any of our activities and events that happen on campus or off campus. But in any case, when CSN is affiliated with any activity. And so we've got a procedure and we'll be posting that, working with uh, Jimmy Martinez and our general counsel's office, but really wanted to thank all of our leadership, Maria Shellhays, Luis Ortega, Nikki Hughes, as well as Chantel Roger Owens. And then Carly, I know that you weren't able to be there, but we'll be circling back, but thank you all for that. And then also just a quick uh, update is that we will be uh, revising the coronavirus webpage because there's a lot of information. As we've said before, um, we never thought that we would be getting into the seventh month of this kind of level of activity, but there's definitely um, information that can be streamlined, um, information that needs to be updated. And I really wanted to thank all of our faculty, staff, our students for saying, can we make some revisions? And you'll definitely be a part of that process. So next slide, please. So on behalf of all of us at CSN, we wanted to make sure that we just refresh this for you as far as a reminder to everyone, all of our students, our employees, our faculty, our staff, that we are reporting those items that need to be reported through our wellness at csn.edu. As Dr. Zaragoza mentioned, we are seeing an uptick in our state across the, uh, across the state, but also in our valley. And so it's very important that we receive very timely information. So first, if you are aware of anyone that you are in contact with or um, specifically from a student or if a faculty or a staff member, if you need to report that you've had a positive COVID test result, we need to know that as soon as possible. And that's one, again, to connect you with the resources that you might need, but then also to do any contact tracing and notify the Southern Nevada Health District along with the results that you may have. We also want to ensure that if you're undergoing and currently pending a test result for COVID, 
please do not come to campus. But again, we want to ensure because there is a quarantine requirement that is associated with that and our wellness team wants to ensure that we're supporting you in that way. If you're exhibiting symptoms of COVID, please do not come to campus. And again, if you're feeling sick at any time, please make sure that you uh, depart the campus again and make sure the contact wellness at csn.edu. If you've received any kind of direction from the Southern Nevada Health District, it's very important that we're aware of that specifically for quarantine purposes and or if there's any other timelines that are associated with that. And then also if you've been in close contact or if you have a student has that has notified you that they've been in close contact, we need to be aware of that as well. Um, and a close contact again is defined as within a close proximity of six feet for 15 minutes or greater. And the CDC has actually revised some of that information. So it's not a continuous 15 minutes, but it can be 15 minutes over a span of time. And again, if you have any questions at any time, please contact wellness at csn.edu. It's a confidential webpage. There's very limited um, individuals that have access. And again, it's just so that we can help guide you in the appropriate manner, give further instructions, and then also provide services if they're needed. Next slide, please. And so you've seen this before, but we always wanna to continue to make sure that everyone has it at the very forefront, especially as we get into cold and flu season. COVID symptoms may look very similar to the regular cold or flu that you may come in, in contact with. But again, these are the symptoms and we wanna make sure that people are being mindful and that our students are being aware. At this point in time in particular, um, somebody may feel like they have the cold, but it also could be that they have an exposure to COVID as well. And so th this information will be posted on our um, COVID uh, web page as well. And so please just make sure that you um, kind of keep up to date on any of these symptoms. So next slide, please. So we've been asked several times from um, faculty, from staff, from, from different leaders, as well as from students. So what happens when I contact wellness at CSN? So first, what this is really about is, is it's a case management so that we can contact anyone that may have a question that may be feeling symptomatic, may not become symptomatic, but may have had a close contact. Maybe they have a friend or a roommate or a family member that is either um, tested positive or that they've been in close contact. So we contact each and every single individual. An interview is done to basically get the circumstances of that contact and or when somebody may have last been on campus, or when they either develop symptoms or when they um, were in a close contact. We get a timeline as well, and so that we can identify um, individuals that may have been a clo in close contact, and we don't provide any specific information, but just provide uh, general guidance and feedback. We also want to ensure that people are advised uh, of quarantine requirements, and then we follow up with you and or the students and or others regarding when they're coming close to the end of their contact, when they are approved to come back to campus as well. Again, I wanna just reiterate that we do have to make a requirement and a, re a report to those individuals that may have been in close contact so that they can either be tested and or that they are aware of the time frame that they need to quarantine as well. We also evaluate whether or not the facilities need to be closed down for any deep cleaning, and then again, provide um, outreach to instructors, supervisors, and ensure that if the, the registrar's office needs to be aware, if a student is concerned about continuing with the class, that we're in close contact uh, with the registrar's office as well. And so again, we just want to make sure that everyone at CSN is safe and secure and healthy. And again, we want to ensure that all of the quarantine requirements are also being met and that people are returned to, to the campus in an appropriate manner. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Dial and obviously we'll be available for questions later. Thank you, Patty, and I appreciate that. And that's great information. Um, I wanted to take just a quick moment today to introduce and to inform everyone at CSN, our employees, um, of a new employee assistant program uh, and a new uh, vendor that we're using called ComPsych that will be rolling out on November 1st. Um, this employee assistance program is very robust. We're very excited here in Human Resources, but they're going to offer many, many services uh, to, to all of our CSN family, including confidential counseling, 
uh, work-life solutions, guidance on legal matters, financial resources. But what's really important is that they're going to be available 24-7. And one thing that we continue to want to emphasize to, to all of our employees is that there are resources uh, available to you. Um, you can contact that, uh, contact us at, at HR uh, through HR customer service or even through the wellness at csn.edu. But we want to make sure that your, your work-life balance is wholesome, uh, that if there are, are stressors or, or, or other challenges that, that um, you or your family are facing, uh, again, during these extraordinary times, that there are resources available to you. So look for more information to come out from Human Resources regarding our, our new EAP partner. We're very excited about this, but I wanted to give everyone just a quick introduction and to, to be uh, uh, on the lookout uh, look for this in the next coming uh, weeks. So thank you. And I will now, I think, turn it over to, to Magoon, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, some upcoming events as well. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> um, I wanted to make sure that uh, please uh, remember to enter your questions in Q&A module uh, on the Teams, please. Um, I know this has been taking a long time for us uh, to get to, to this point. However, as you can see from the results presented here on the screen, uh, CSN's body has uh, overwhelmingly favored uh, in-person ceremony over a course of two surveys. Uh, in the light uh, of that, uh, our team are uh, led by very hard work and incredible AVP uh, of Laura Latimer has tossed around a number of ideas and dates to try and present something where students could walk across a stage. But with persistence of COVID-19, even after five months out, we have no ability to gather a group of this size together. Um, uh, Eric, next slide, please. Thank you. Additionally, uh, as you see, even though every NC school has similarly seen an overwhelming desire for in-person event, they're all uh, moving an online graduations that so that this important milestone can be celebrated before much more time goes by. Uh, even now, many students may not participate uh, as they may have moved on to the next stage in their life and we don't want to lose any uh, more of them. Uh, it is extremely important to uh, Dr. Zaragoza and of course all of us that this uh, extremely important event, which for many of our students are fairly uh, students and family first, uh, does not go unrecognized in a very special way. Um, that further said, uh, Eric, next slide please. Um, that is uh, why we are going to do not only a virtual event, but also a special graduation photo opportunity on each of three campuses where there is more of live celebration to mark the accomplishment. Um, at this photo op, uh, they take picture with Dr. Zaragoza while receiving diploma cover and they all a special web page with their photo and a personal message. The virtual ceremony, virtual ceremony will contain all of the elements that an in-person graduation would have, uh, and our graduates will be publicly recognized so that we uh, commem commemorate uh, this momentous occasion in a special way without having to uh, congregate with others in close contact. Um, it is our hope that this model will offer the level of recognition that our students deserve and also the protection they need. Uh, we want to ensure that each and every student is given a special shout out that they have earned through their hard work and determination. And we believe that this provides that. Um, if you have any questions, please reach us out to, about the commencement uh, to me or to uh, Laura Latimer, uh, and, and we definitely can provide that for you. Uh, thank you for all the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Z. Brian, I think it's back to you for the question sessions. Thank you. 
Are staff and students supposed to report COVID-19 illness or exposure if they are working exclusively at home or taking online classes only and haven't been to campus? Yeah, Brian, thank you for that question, whoever posed that. So yes, I apologize if I wasn't clear in my updates earlier, but yes, we want to know any um, CSN affiliated um, exposure and or illness because we want to ensure that we're connecting everyone to services that may be available. Uh, one of the very first things that we do is to reach out to, if it's a student, to reach out to their instructor to let them know, and then also to continue to monitor. Um, some individuals, if they've been exposed, may have a question about, if I need to get a test, where can I go and is it free? So we do have information that we can also provide, but want to ensure that everyone first and foremost is, is taking care of themselves, if there's any additional assistance that we can point them to, um, that we're making them aware. So yes, it's whether you're on campus or off campus, um, if you're remote or um, if you have any connection whatsoever. So thank you. Yeah, and Patty, if I can follow up, it, it is important and, and again emphasize that um, when you contact wellness at CSN, it is confidential, but if it's from the employee side, we can answer questions about possible health insurance. If you have questions about that, offer testing sites, maybe you have questions about leave. Um, so there, there are many things we help help you with during that time. And so it, it is beneficial uh, for, for employees to go ahead and contact us and then uh, human resources, we can help you navigate some of those, uh, uh, some of those um, questions and in what could be a very stressful time. Right, and as I mentioned also, Bill, is for the students in particular, we also want to ensure that if they have any questions regarding um, their status in their class or if they think that they may not be able to complete that we um, are ensured that we're in contact with the registrar's office as well. And so thank you for that question again. Brian, you may be muted. Yes, yeah, so Brian, I, I don't think we can hear you, but I do see that there's another question regarding if there's free available COVID-19 testing for CSN employees. There absolutely is, and it's not just for CSN employees, but also for our students. And so we can certainly um, provide that link of that information of where people can go for uh, free testing. And the Southern Nevada Health District has a schedule. It does um, rotate from, from time to time, but there definitely is testing that's free um, for not just uh, faculty, staff, but also for our students and others. Brian, I show you as muted. Yeah, I'm good now, thank you. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> uh, so one question um, is once uh, we are back on campus and continue and uh, primarily on campus for our classes, will there still be um, an availability for web remote classes um, as some students have become very uh, uh, accustomed to that new delivery method. Margo, you want to try that? Sure, so um, I think that's a really terrific question and, and right now we are really trying to balance uh, safety uh, with solid pedagogy and, and I imagine, it's funny, uh, earlier today had a chance to meet with some of the folks in IR and we are discovering from some recent student surveys that that students right now are, are feeling pretty good about the online environment and what's happening. So um, I think that as we move forward, uh, things are probably going to look a little bit different in the instructional environment. That said, though, I know that that I want to see students back on campus and I know that there are a lot of faculty and students that are anxious to get back on campus as well. But as we continue to learn about the instructional environment and what works uh, and what we can do better, um, I think those are going to be ongoing conversations among the faculty, the department chairs and the deans. Thank you. Do we have any updates on the interim VPAA search? 
Uh, yes, actually, we certainly do. And so actually the uh, screening committee finished their uh, interviews today. And so they uh, they will be assessing those candidates and will be forwarding uh, finalists on to the hiring committee. Uh, there will also be um, live forums uh, using Microsoft Teams um, so that uh, uh, we will have that process in place. And then for those forums, um, as a best practice, we will record those and make sure they're closed captioned so that uh, our CSN family can provide feedback uh, on, on the finalists. And so our hope is, is that we can then uh, begin executive team transitions here very quickly. Um, following up sort of in that same vein, um, the screening committee, for the Chief of Staff and Chief Diversity Officer met yesterday yesterday afternoon. That position is closed, and so they are going to begin their process of, of reviewing uh, applications very soon. And so we are moving forward with that search um, as well. So uh, good, good news on those those two fronts. Thank you very much. As we begin planning for the new spring semester. Can you provide an update on how furloughs will be managed? Will employees choose their own furlough days? And will or will CSN close on specific days? So that's a great question. And actually, I have a meeting Thursday and uh, we'll be receiving some guidance from INCHI on that. Um, if everyone will recall, we went through a shared governance process um, earlier this year and had come up with some furlough guidelines. We also want to await some guidance from INCHI, which will happen Thursday, and I plan on being able to inform our, our, our CSN community what those uh, furlough guidelines will look like at our next town hall. And so uh, I will know much more on Thursday and, and then we'll be informing uh, uh, everyone. As a reminder, uh, furloughs will start um, in the spring semester in January, but you will begin to be able to take furlough days in December as we run payroll sort of a month uh, behind more or less we get paid. We always get paid on the first day of the following months and so uh, that will commence in December but the actual furlough pay that you'll see on your paychecks will begin in January. Thank you Bill. Can we go to our offices now by ourselves? Yeah, so thank you for that question. And we do continue if you're not somebody that has been identified as required to be on campus um, on an ongoing basis, we do ask that you still notify and seek approval uh, through your um, your supervisory chain so that we can ensure that one, not just that um, that that you have access to your your office, but that also that we can ensure that your safety is is first and foremost taken care of. Um, we also have been uh, implementing a number of cost saving measures such as reducing um, the the use of air conditioning. And so if it gets a little warm, we're, we don't know if you're there unless you notify us. We also want to ensure that we keep your area clean and that should um, we have an unfortunate situation where someone has tested positive and you were in close contact within that area that we know that you were there. Um, I don't know if Margo or Clarissa wanted to add anything. No, Patty, I just really appreciate your emphasizing that we're, we're really just trying to keep track of uh, of who's on campus from a from a safety perspective and uh, and making sure that that we're able to support you if you are on campus. Brian, before we go on, can somebody uh, uh, update the slides uh, so we can get rid of the slide and actually see the talking uh, faces, please? There we go. Yeah, Clarissa, did you want to add anything about the access to campus and or Kimiko? Sure, um, so we so at North Las Vegas, we just are working hard. You have your campus management team that's accessible. You can always contact uh, me or Sarah Taylor, um, but we have our campus life and uh, we're meeting on a weekly basis via Teams. So we try to be uh, do our best to be as responsive as we can. So if you need access, um to to the campus and um you know and and provide um the justification through your supervisory chain we do our best to try to be very responsive to that and get it loaded onto the campus access list 
Thank you very much. Is there any new information in light of the massive budget cuts if there are going to be buyouts offered? Bill, you want to give an update? Sure, and and, and I will uh, I, I will address the the voluntary retirement incentive program, and I'll I'll defer to, to Mary Kay about budget cuts because I don't want to to address that necessarily. But um, we have actually uh, created the final survey. It will be a confidential survey that will be going out to those employees who are possibly eligible for the voluntary retirement incentive program. Uh, that survey will probably be going out next Friday with a two week time frame. Uh, confidential confidential information will then come back um, and, and we will review to see what is the level of interest across all employee groups. Um, and then depending on the feedback that will let us uh, have a data informed approach of the creation. Um, of the program that I will then, along with our, our budget reduction task force committee on that, that I'll bring back to the larger committee to make recommendations. The due date given to my to me by, by Dr. Zaragoza was December the 1st, and so um, we will have uh, definitive answers by December 1st that if we move forward with that program, it will be in the spring of 2021. Thanks again, Bill. If a student just recently informed a faculty or staff member that they had COVID over three months ago, should the student still be encouraged to report that they had COVID? If so, how far back should faculty, staff, and students report past COVID cases? Hey, thank you. And yes, we do ask that you still report those cases. One for for just a tracking because we do want to ensure that again, if there's some improvements that we can make to our processes that we are doing that. We also know that students um, may have um, potentially stopped um, attending class and may not have gone through our process and we want to ensure that we can support them accordingly. And then also even for our employees, we want to ensure if there's anything additional that we can do to support any um, of the different um, activities that occurred or um, if there's any ongoing need from a health perspective because we're learning much more about the virus as we go through this process and you know there are reoccurrences and some prolonged health concerns as well. So yes, if you have any information again, it will be kept confidential and we just want to ensure so that we can do the very best for CSN moving forward and support people as they need it. Thanks, Patty. Are there any updates on a permanent continued remote working policy for those positions that lend themselves to stay remote even after a complete return to campus? Yeah, I'll be glad to give that update. And so uh, myself and, and, and Mr. James Martinez, uh, our chief legal counsel, um, have are reviewing the final uh, draft of that policy, at which point it will go through the regular uh, policy making proposal here at CSN. Um, and so at that point, if if and when we return to uh, again a, a phase three or return to campus, we will then have that policy which will help guide us for, for positions that can remain uh, remote uh, as we have kind of learned in this in this new new normal we're in that, that some of our positions indeed can remain remote either part time or even full time. So um, those final uh, revisions and reviews are taking place right now. Terrific. What is the status of the of the um, salary appeal process? OK, so we're in the final stage of the salary appeals process from the the uh, from the salary study. And so those notifications have been uh, sent to uh, affected vice presidents uh, and executive council members, as was outlined in the process uh, when the salary study first commenced. And so um, those are under review with affected vice presidents and executive council members, uh, at which time when uh, th those final reviews are then sent back to human resources, employees will be notified uh, by myself uh, or, 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 or HR. Uh, and so that should be forthcoming in the next uh, few days as we finalize the salary study. So we are uh, winding that process down. Has the switch to online learning given any insights to the student need to develop reading strategies? 
So what we are learning through looking at student success data and looking at student survey feedback is that while students are feeling much better about uh, operating in the online environment, there is still some concern in terms of those students that really do learn better in a in a face to face environment. We've not specifically drilled into reading skills, um, but one thing is for certain um, in the we were able to take a look at spring grades and we're currently analyzing summer grades, but uh, the the number of increase in in D or F grades uh, was was insignificant. So in terms of grades, uh, students performed uh, about as well, maybe even a little better in the spring of 2020 than they did in the spring of 2019. But we're doing a little bit deeper dive into what those numbers really mean. Uh, and again, have some really terrific survey data uh, that adds to some survey data that we took a look at uh, a few months ago. And probably in the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, be prepared to uh, share that, that new data with uh, with the cabinet and the uh, and the broader college community. Thank you, Margo. Is there any update on appointed shared governance liaisons? Yes, I'd be glad to give an update. Very exciting news. Uh, our, our shared governance liaison pilot program uh, really uh, kicked off last month. We had a, an onboarding um, uh, session with, with our th three shared governance liaison uh, members, uh, Dr. Chuck Milney, uh, Nikki Hughes, and uh, also uh, Ashley uh, Rodriguez. And so uh, they have actually commenced their work and they're beginning that right now. And we're excited about that, that that group is off to a strong start and uh, just really exciting news for that program as we continue to also then finalize our, our shared governance policy. But uh, um, great work going on by, by those three individuals. Yeah, Bill, about to piggyback on that. The, the other element too is that all of us uh, on the cabinet are, are, are available to meet with stakeholder groups, and so we've really uh, re been reaching out and having great conversations with, uh, you know, AFA, with the Faculty Senate, with NFA, and, and Classified Council, and so. Uh, uh, it, working through your stakeholder groups. If you feel you want to hear from us directly, all uh, you have to do is invite us. I and mean, this is part of our shared governance commitment to you all. Thank you, Dr. Saragosa. Is it all right to visit one of the CSN libraries unannounced, or do we need to be cleared to visit the library? So Margo, would you like to start or I certainly can. Um, obviously our libraries are open um, during normal hours and so we do want to ensure that um, the libraries are available for our students. They do are and they are operating with capacity limitations and then obviously all of the the appropriate COVID protocols. But Margo, I didn't know if you wanted to add on. Sure, again, um, the, the libraries are open uh, primarily uh, 10 to 6 and we're doing a rotation across the different campuses until 8 o'clock. So any any given night uh, there is a, a, a library open up until 8 o'clock. Uh, again, as employees, I would encourage you if you are um, going to be coming to campus, it's always good to check in with your supervisor and that kind of thing. But the libraries are open and so if you were to come to campus and go directly to the library um, as long as capacity has not exceeded uh, the, the limit, you, you would be welcome to come into the library and peruse the, the stacks and, and uh, learn stuff. Awesome. Don't forget to enter questions into the Q&A section uh, in the Teams. Is there any update on the Dean of Arts and Letters search? Absolutely, and I'll actually give an update on both the Dean of Arts and Letters and the Dean of Health Sciences. We have contracted with Gold Hill and Associates, and so we're finalizing our marketing brochures to um, go out. Uh, it's our hope that we will either have those positions um, 
uh, advertised at the end of this week or early next week. Um, and part of that is, again, when you use an external uh, third party uh, recruitment firm, we put together robust marketing um, uh, brochure for that. So we've been working with, with Richard Lake and his team. They've just done an excellent job. But we basically are going to, these are going to be nationwide searches. Um, and uh, so we're at the, the beginning stages of that process with the thought being we, we really would like to have the finalists uh, on board right really at the beginning of the spring 2021 semester. So uh, uh, those are moving forward as well. So uh, very, very busy times in human resources as it relates to talent acquisition. I think we just lost Brian. Yeah. And, and maybe if I could give one other quick update while Brian's coming back is um, uh, we have also with CSN sent off our um, our, our uh, uh, October iteration uh, for hiring freeze exceptions. And so uh, that is uh, in process as well right now. So that's another update as it relates to uh, uh, recruitment, talent acquisition and, and human resources. Thank you, Bill. Can somebody read? Uh, are there any yes, other questions? Uh, let me go with Val Brevington. Is there updates? Uh, sorry, is there a tentative date for interim BPAA forms? Bill, you're muted. Yeah, now, now I'm having some issues. Um, so the, the look for those. There will be an announcement coming from from Human Resources, but those will probably be next week, probably Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, but again, we are going to record those forums and then we will be able to post those uh, and, and make sure that they're transcribed closed captioned so that individuals that may not be able to attend the live event can then view those and then we will send out a brief survey with a deadline so that the um, hiring committee can review that feedback from, from, our, from our CSN employees. So that will happen uh, next week, early next week. So look for an announcement from Human Resources. I'm trying to pretend like Brian, so thank you, Bill. This is a follow up to the question about how students are doing. Have you considered uh, com uh, comparing their reading placement test to their final grades? So at this time, we have not been uh, comparing placement tests to uh, to final grades in terms of reading, but um, uh, if, if that's something that is of interest to you, um, feel free to reach out to me directly and uh, and, and we can certainly uh, connect you with with IR and, uh, and, and and maybe have a conversation about that. Yeah, Margo, and if I could follow up on that, that, that question really is the, uh, the million dollar question uh, throughout the country. And, and that is, uh, you know, what kind of impact has the online environment and remote environment had on student learning? Uh, and I think it's, it's fair to say that, that all of us uh, at CSN and nationally are trying to answer that question. Uh, and we are getting surveys and we are getting feedback, uh, uh, but I, I think that's also an area of opportunity for us, uh, you know, both as individuals and as departments to, to start looking at, at what that means uh, uh, to your specific discipline, uh, because uh, my sense is that it's going to vary. Uh, in terms of what students uh, are majoring in, their discipline, the, the demand. Uh, you know, there's a lot of elements at play uh, and, and there's not going to be a, a cookie cutter response to that. You know, I keep uh, suggesting that a lot of the data is bimodal. Some students love it and some students don't. Uh, and so uh, I think it's really important to, to, to us as a learning uh, institution to keep asking that question and to find ways uh, to get good answers for us that make sense for our discipline and for our students. So uh, again, I encourage and challenge us to keep asking that question and to keep probing for answers. Thank you, Dr. Saragosa. Can you tell us what is being considered eligible for the buyout? Yes, absolutely. And we, we have a preliminary framework because again, we want to take a data informed approach. And then if there is sufficient interest, would we then begin actually writing the parameters of the program? But the frameworks we have used are basically aligned with the NSHE phased in retirement, which is 
Um, more or less, an individual who has 55 years of age with 10 years of service, 60 years of age with five years of service, or a combined what I call 80 points. So between years of service and the employee's age would equal 80. So those are the three criteria we are using to compile the list to which we will send the confidential survey at the end of next week. Thank you for that information. What specific resources have been allocated to support faculty in online instructional design? So in our Office of eLearning, we do have um, a budget that uh, is allocated for faculty development. And uh, we've, we've always offered uh, uh, training in terms of the use of our learning management system. Since we went remote, uh, not only has Terry Norris and his team continued to deliver just in time training on Canvas, but along with uh, with OTS, we've incorporated all different types of telecommunication sorts of, uh, of tools uh, and uh, whether it's uh, lecture capture software, whether it's uh, respondents lockdown and helping faculty know how to how to be able to administer assessments in the online environment in a in a secure way. Uh, we also had an invitation this past summer um, to participate through Complete College America uh, in um, ASU's uh, two week master class. Uh, we had such incredible response from faculty in less than 12 hours. Uh, we had 50 seats that were allocated for us. Uh, that were taken by faculty, both full-time and part-time. Because of that uh, tremendous uh, response, we were able to launch a second two-week master class where all 100 seats were allocated for CSN faculty, uh, both full-time and part-time. Uh, and we are continuing that education. I, I feel like in some ways, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and because faculty had a real need for having a better understanding of uh, how to how to really uh, utilize that online environment, we had tremendous response. Um, something else that we've done that's somewhat tangential, but I think is related is that through our Centers for Academic Success, Dr. Shelley Keller has deployed uh, tutors in an embedded fashion. Those tutors have been embedded into specific Canvas course shells, primarily in math and English. And so we've had this experience where faculty and students have had an extra set of uh, pair of hands, if you will, to help students and to serve as a partner with the faculty member. Uh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but but we we ran about we had about uh 50 55 sections in the summer where we did a pilot and we more than doubled that number in the fall and so if faculty would be interested in having an embedded tutor um we want to we want to partner with you um in addition we also uh, uh put resources from the library uh because we've got embedded librarians in those course shells as well We've also more than, than doubled uh, the hours in terms of sp uh, smart thinking, um, which is that 24 seven um, tutoring opportunity for students. So those are just some of the resources that we have put toward not only um, supporting faculty, but also supporting students in addition to what we can do for faculty. Uh, Margaret, I also encourage uh, faculty, uh, if you know of some professional development opportunities that are out there, uh, and if it's uh, one that's going to be beneficial to you or to your department, uh, to let us know. Uh, we're supporting uh, <clears throat> as much as we can professional development activities, uh, uh, especially as it relates to remote and online learning. So let us know if these opportunities become available. Thank you. Is there a planned reorganization of facilities management since a number of personnel have left CSN or retired already? 
So, so thank you um, for that question. And you know, obviously in this current environment, we work very closely with the Budget Reduction Committee, with Dr. Zaragoza, with Mary Kay, with Bill, uh, to really look at where we're heading into the future. Obviously there's a lot of unknowns, and so we continue uh, to look at how we can streamline efficiencies and effectiveness. And so thank you very much for that question and stay tuned. Brian, I think we lost you again. I think you're just on mute. Brian, you were either on mute or we lost you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Are there discussions underway that would require new students to complete an online readiness orientation prior to enrolling in online classes? So we've actually had a series of modules in place for probably more than a year now uh, to help students uh, determine their, their readiness for the online environment, but not just readiness, but actually providing readiness for the online environment. Um, at this time, it is, uh, it is not mandated, it is, it is suggested. Uh, but I would be very open to uh, having dialogue with faculty leadership in terms of uh, having that uh, be a true box to check for students, particularly as we anticipate continuing in this online environment uh, for uh, at least for the for the coming spring semester. Thank you. What plans are in place for the diversity department's mission and visions relating to the Sawgrass report? So we, we've been uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the evolution, if you will, of the diversity agenda uh, at the College of Southern Nevada. And I think the Sawgrass report uh, really captured the, the importance of, of uh, uh, elevating diversity uh, so that it becomes an institutional priority with institutional accountability. And so the, the, the primary element uh, that, that I have found to be very trenchant in, in the uh, Solgrass report was the importance of creating that accountability amongst the leadership team. And so one of the elements that, that I've uh, already, uh, uh, and I think Bill already talked about, was uh, elevating the diversity function and diversity officer position into cabinet status. Uh, and as chief of staff, you now have a diversity officer that can communicate across any one of the cabinet officers uh, and then also ensure that there's accountability in terms of diversity plan. The second element is, is the need for a diversity plan period. Uh, and uh, as uh, again, Saul Gress uh, uh, very uh, appropriately pointed out, we truly don't have an institutional diversity plan. Those are two of the first two steps uh, that, that are going to be kind of created moving forward. The organizational adjustments will follow, uh, and we definitely want to have a diversity officer in place first. So again, we are rebooting diversity uh, to really be a driver here at the College of Southern Nevada. Excellent. How many full time employees were employed full time to support faculty instructional design in the Office of eLearning before moving to full distance education? And how many are there now? My concern is that outsourcing faculty development wasn't productive since faculty were introduced to a lot of tools that CSN is not willing to fund. So I'm going to do some quick math in my head. Um, uh, we've we've got uh, we have four instructional designer uh, positions, um, and then we've got our our um, director. So uh, so that's five. Um, I know that one of those positions has been. Um, vacant as uh, Dr. Asherian has been serving in the interim uh, dean role. Uh, and I know that we just recently lost uh, Michelle Chan. Uh, uh, she moved on to, to UNLV for a, a, another wonderful opportunity. And uh, we are 
we have requested that position uh, to move forward. Um, so we've had the same number of instructional designers uh, on deck prior to COVID, and we and we just lost Michelle uh, just a few weeks ago, I believe, a couple weeks ago, um, and we're already moving forward to uh, to get permission to to fill that position. Um, in terms of uh, tools that that uh, that faculty have been exposed to that that we're not funding, um, I'm not really quite sure what that is referencing, and I would be very happy to have a, a deeper conversation in that regard. I know that uh, the kinds of things that we have been providing uh, instruction on have to do with um, uh, with the current tools that, that we are using, many of which uh, McGunt has introduced to us. Um, and, uh, and I know that the ASU course focused a great deal on pedagogy, uh, and was based in the, the Canvas learning management system. So again, um, definitely are looking to uh, fill the gaps in that regard, um, but would be happy to have a deeper conversation to address uh, some of the some of the other uh, concerns that were mentioned in the question. Thank you, Margot. Will grant and aid be available in spring 2021? And if so, when should the process to apply be started? So yes, grant aid is available and I would probably go ahead and start that process now as we process those applications through uh, through the semester. And so if you have any questions, just please email HR customer service uh, at CSN.edu and we'll be glad to help you with any uh, specific questions you have on your uh, individual circumstance. OK, so that closes uh, that comes to the end of our session. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here and I wanted to share that there are some upcoming trainings on teams being offered through CAPE. So check the CAPE calendar in, um, and in re that does include one uh, Teams 101 uh, training that will be offered tomorrow at two o'clock. So and we also uh, at the at.csn.edu slash background, you have the capability of getting a hold of the nice backgrounds that you see us using uh, here in this session. So thank you all and I will now turn it back over to Dr. Saragossa. Thank you, and, and let me just echo uh, Brian's uh, appreciation for all of us being uh, at the town hall. I think the panel continues to do a great job, and uh, it, it's a great dialogue uh, uh, to have every other week, and, and let's continue this. Uh, it gives us a very good idea uh, of, of what's you know, on your mind and what are the pressing questions that, that we have to address. Uh, so again, keep the questions coming, uh, provide us with your input, uh, and let's continue our journey back to normality. Uh, and uh, let's not forget, we are all in this together. So stay safe, God bless, and see you at our next town hall meeting. Adios.